What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again, and this time we return with the one and only Carl Sanders of Nile. Great to be able to talk with you today, man. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Alex. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you back. The last interview we did, first off, I want to give a shout out to everybody who's viewed that interview. That's in the top 20 most watched interviews on this channel now, so... Uh, Thank you for also <laughs> being a great interviewee as well. But uh, it's cool because the last time I spoke to you, we were, you know, talk, you know, Vile Melodic Rights was the newest uh, addition to your catalog. But we got a brand new uh, solo album coming out, Surian Apocalypse. And this is the last Carl Sanders solo album since 2009. So what was the sort of thought process going into the making of Saurian Apocalypse? Was this like just picking up where you left off after uh, Saurian Exorcisms, or was this like just a sort of a new beginning or a standout? No, I think it was very much uh, after Saurian Exorcism was finished, and I was, you know, I had plenty of time to think about what I was going to do next. And I, I came up with the title, right? I had the concept for quite a long time. Saurian Apocalypse, yeah. Lizards take over the planet, mankind destroys itself. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I didn't really have time to work on it. I was really busy with Nile in those years. Uh, it was taking all my time. Yeah, you definitely uh, were busy. Because to have just to have what should not be unearthed and vile melodic right, just those two albums coming out in the same decade alone is uh, pretty uh, uh, occupying. Yep. Um, a lot of challenges. We we you know totally revamped the lineup. Uh, did a lot of touring in those years. There was a lot of energy being spent on now. Um, it really wasn't until uh, the pandemic, when all our touring was canceled, I found myself at home going. Uh, well, I guess I have no excuse not to work on this third Saurian record. You know, people were writing me, you know, messages going, hey, Carl, when are you going to do that third Saurian record? And after a while, you try to answer people's, you know, earnest, heartfelt messages. Hey, when are you going to work on it? Well, I, I guess I'm going to start working on it now because what else am I going to do? <laughs> we're, our touring is canceled. I got nothing but time. Yeah. Um, and having an apocalyptic so, theme yeah, record. This was my. <laughs> it's perfect. You know, like when you go to school, you come back in September to school and you have to write that paper at the beginning. What I did with my summer vacation. Yeah. Well, this is what I did with my pandemic vacation. Yeah, your apocalyptic vacation. What better uh, time to write an album <laughs> about the apocalypse than now? I was saying that, like, every death metal album that has come out before the pandemic aged 10 times better because of the pandemic. When you look at every Fear Factory album, right. when you look at every Sepultura album, when you look at everything, uh, and even with the Saurian albums, I mean, when you look at Saurian Meditation and uh, Saurian Exorcisms, it almost feels like uh, it was always leading up to Saurian Apocalypse. I think that this was a good sort of lead up to it. Yes. Yeah, it's like the culmination. I, I think that's why the, the record company talks about it as a trilogy because they they do feel like kind of like that you know the story of meditations it's meditation music for reptiles <laughs> and that's it's really what it was like um i remember taking my kid who would have been very young when uh we did story and meditations we were at the zoo at the alligator farm and we were you know looking in the eyes of these alligators and crocodiles as they were just sitting there doing nothing staring off in space totally chill yeah right and i'm like man these guys have like infinite pools in their eyes they're just like so deep like it's a gateway to another dimension or universe that they're dreaming about right it's just soaring meditations and Saurian exorcisms was kind of like, what happens if you think about that too much? <laughs> well, now you're gonna need an exorcism and get these reptiles out of your soul, right? So Saurian apocalypse, well, mankind violently destroys itself. Lizards, insects, reptiles, stay with the world. 
which would probably be for the better given the course of humanity lately. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, do you almost like look at this trilogy? Because I, I do look at it as a trilogy. Like when I got the album uh, Sorry and Apocalypse, I actually went back and listened to – I actually – before I listened to it, I listened to the other two first, almost kind of like, you know, knowing where I left off. Do you almost mm-hmm. like look at this album? Like do you recommend if, some, if this is somebody's first Sorian album to like go back and listen to the – first two first you almost look at these albums like lord of the rings you have to listen to the first one to get the second one and so on and so forth i I don't think that you have to Uh, of course if you do you will reap the rewards and the benefits of it but i don't think you have to i I think you can pick it up at any point and still find enjoyment in it um they i think they stand on on their own just fine when it comes to the series, is this like a different mind frame or maybe different a form of expression than what we get with Niall? Like, is this showing a different side of who Carl Sanders is uh, in a way? Or is there a similar method behind the madness that applies to all of your projects from uh, Sorian to Niall to even going back earlier to Mariah? Um, I think this one is different. Uh, I think, like, with Niall, it's... Uh, really heavy, uh, dark, brutal, and crushing, but it's dealing with real historical violence, you know, history, ancient Egyptian mythology, uh, religion, you know, you know, warfare, you know, shit that actually happened. I got it from somewhere. It's based, however loosely, in reality, right? It's history. Whereas, uh, the Saurian thing, it's quiet, it's kind of hypnotizing, and it's completely not based in history. <laughs> Lizards haven't taken over our planet. That's fiction. Yeah. <laughs> uh, despite what we might think, you know, looking around at the state of things in America, this is fiction, right? <laughs> Lizards haven't taken over our country, you know the David Icke conspiracy theories that all our politicians have been replaced by lizards in the guise of men. That's science fiction. It's not reality. Well, it almost seems like you take inspiration from multiple sources, Sorian being more uh, fantasy driven Mm -hmm. and Niall being more Mm -hmm. historical driven. When it comes to like your songwriting process is almost like uh, research or like diving into literature or mythology just as much part of the songwriting as you know picking up the guitar and playing like are you looking at other Absolutely. mediums of art mm-hmm. um, in that same way you know we're now the songs are really birthed um, from you know looking up whatever it is I'm talking about doing a little research just so I can write the song, you know. Uh, and that kind of guides the music, right? Because I always do the lyrics first. And that really guides where the song goes. With the Saurian stuff, the words and the concepts also drive it, but it's, it's instrumental music. So like the story just kind of like exists in my head because there's not a whole lot of song lyrics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like other things that the voice does besides normal singing. But the concepts that drive the songs shape those songs. So they're, they're you know, inherently entwined, you know, the concept and the song. Uh, when I was working on Story and Apocalypse, this was so strong that I was like, you know, this is way more than song lyrics. This is a fucking book. So I wrote a book, a sci-fi uh, short novels, like 45,000 words. I've done two drafts. Hopefully I'm going to finish it maybe after the next novel record. I don't know. But it's all the uh, uh, concepts behind all the songs and how they, you know, they tell this kind of story because I'd be playing the songs and i have this movie in my head. Like, and it was so strong. It was like, this is like a movie it's a fucking movie 
Well, I've always said that uh, Nile was almost the historian or the thinking man's death metal band, and I do feel this way about Saurian too, even though it is instrumental. If you don't mind me asking, though, because you have all these different sources of inspiration, has there ever been a time where maybe your personal life or your personal experiences also influenced the way that you write a music, or has music always been a means of just escaping a reality and you know, kind of expressing something that you couldn't normally do in everyday life? All right, so we're equal parts escapism and catharsis. Yeah. Um, and somehow they work together. Like, when I look back at the stuff after it's done, what I thought was escapist fiction was really just my way of dealing with shit that was on my fucking mind. Um, like, the immutable mask of self-deception on the Sword and Apocalypse record. Um, while it's part of the story, it was also my way of dealing with my friend that had died. Um, he had drank himself to death. Um, yeah, and that really fucked me up for a while. Um, uh, but I worked through it. I wrote that piece of music and when I finished writing the piece of music the piece of music that I thought I was doing an escapist sci-fi thing for well wait a minute I'm just fucking sad about my friend dying that's that's what that fucking thing is okay all right so sometimes it's one thing but it's also the other thing yeah in there somehow I don't know you know there's multiple sides to any good piece of music or art or anything really. It, it can't be one dimensional or it would be it would be flat. Yeah. Well it's gotta have like different yeah. things about it, just like life. Yeah, well when you look at a band like Fear Factory that, you know, sings a lot about artificial intelligence and those sort of theories, or you take a band like what, you know, Sepultura did with their tribal elements, I think they, they are a very they are a history lesson and I can't tell you how much I know about mythology now thanks to Nile. But like uh they are a history lesson, but people also have a way, I think, of relating to it musically. I think your guitar soloing and the riffs also reflect an emotion that we feel in the heart. While maybe the lyricism and the concept mm -hmm. is good for the mind, I think the music is what is meant for the heart as well. Mm -hmm. And the drums go right to the body. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to like getting this inspiration, do ideas just like come out of the blue for you or do you actively look for inspiration? Are you like in the library or on the History Channel or always just browsing through? Well, I'm always kind of like aware because um, you never know when inspiration is going to strike or, or when it's not going to strike. So I try to always be working on some stuff so that way if the inspiration does come i'm already in in motion i know what to do with it um when you just aren't actively working on stuff you may not recognize uh, oh this is a genius idea and this is what to do with it right because you're you're not in in motion right i, I don't know if that's the right word to describe it but um, if you're already in there, if you're already in fighting stance, right, then you know what to do with that punch and kick if it comes at you. If you just stand there smoking a cigarette and somebody smashes you in the face, well, you know, you weren't in there. I like to stay in there, always, you know, working. If I don't have an inspired idea, well, it's time to go learn something new or beat up an idea. Yeah, but I really like the ones that just come out of nowhere. But if you're not actively in there, a lot of them just fall by the wayside. Absolutely. I, and inspiration sometimes yeah. strikes at the most inconvenient times as well, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. Yep. Yes, it does. I like to have my gear always ready to go. Like, just always ready to go. So that I can go from idea to hit the record button in less than a minute. Otherwise, I'll be going like, eh, well, 
This is a pretty good idea, but is it worth getting up and going in the other room, turning on the amp, turn on the DAW, fire up the mic preamps, move the microphone in front of the cabinet until it sounds good? Yeah, there's inertia, <laughs> right? Definitely. Human anti-creative inertia. So I like to have shit, so I flip a button, and here we go. Definitely. Now, I know that this question is a little on the cliche side, but I've always wanted to know this to, you know, being a, you know, a death metal musician from South Carolina and, you know, just there's, you know, you Nile started at a time when, you know, Cannibal Corpse and Morbid Angel and all the greats were, you know, absolutely killing it. But and even with Saurian, uh, with the Saurian series, you know, taking inspiration from, you know, the reptilian conspiratorial ideas. What kind of made you explore this concept? Like, was there like a pinnacle moment in your young musician career that made you want to write about this mythology in a way? Or did it, was it just kind of like, it just kind of happened by accident? I, I think it kind of happened by accident. So I was just chilling out. You know, the, the Saurian stuff was my way of uh, relaxing in between metal tours. Because when you're doing a death metal tour, it's not just your band that you hear. You sound check, you play a show every night, right? That's twice, two doses of metal. Well, you also got all the sound checks from all the other bands, all the other bands that played on the show. Uh, it's a fucking healthy ass dose. It's a big shot, the big needle of death metal every day, right? Um, well, after a while, even a person who loves death metal and loves consuming mass quantities of death metal. Every once in a while, I need some motherfucking peace of quiet where I can hear myself fucking think <laughs> without blast beats turning my brain to jello, whether I want it or not. Because mm -hmm. if you're in the building <laughs> while suffocation is playing, whether you're actively listening or participating or not, they're still turning your brain to jello. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> so this project was my way of still playing music but turning it down a little bit. It's it's your stone sour. Yeah. It's your stone sour like uh, what Corey Taylor does with Slipknot in a way. Yes, exactly. But, so but definitely not you know, and, and that kind of morphed into I mean, what is this what does this remind me of? This music I'm playing and it was like you know some sort of ancient Lovecraftian reptile mythos, you know, that's, you know, on acoustic instruments. <laughs> Definitely. Lizards don't have electric guitars. Yet, right? yet. But I mean, you know, we, after, after all the cool shit that Boss has done over the years and all the other great guitar brands, you never know. You're, you, there's, you need to get your own custom lizard pedal, the Carl Sanders Soren lizard pedal or something like that. Yes, yes, it would have like the exact perfect reverb and the the right slinky compression on it. Yeah. And then when people hear it, their eyes turn into what is that of a lizard? <laughs> it's a great idea. Now all we got to do is talk one of these pedal manufacturers into it. Say, dude, it's a great idea. We'll sell a whole handful of them. <laughs> hey, hey, you got you got yourself a sponsor right here. <laughs> now, awesome. And, and I have one more question for you. And this again goes back to the entirety of the catalog, whether it be Nile or Saurian or anything like that. But when you look at every album that you have done, whether it is The Black Seeds of Vengeance or uh, Those Whom the Gods Dece uh, Detest or you look at these, you know, other Saurian albums, do you think that the concept or the meaning or whatever story that they could have written about can age over time and develop even more as more and more people listen to it? Or do you think that every album you make is more or less just a time stamp, a representation of who you are at that particular time? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a question that is impossible to answer on its face. As soon as you answer it one way, we could look at it the other way. Yeah. Um, yes, those are 
by their very nature, well, that's the album that I made in 2004, that's the one I made in 2009, and here's the one I made in 2019. You could look at it that way, but I think you could still listen to any of them at any point in our future, you know, experience, how, whenever that may, even 50 years from now. 50 years from now, this will still be relaxing music. <laughs> For you know, just put on, chill out, trip your balls off, fall asleep, have some weird dreams. Definitely. It's still good for that. Well, you have Saurian to help you fall asleep and then wake you up with some Nile. I think you have uh, the best aspects. Mm -hmm. You have music for the day and music for the night. <laughs> and uh, there was yeah, one. Just like Elvis taking. <laughs> <laughs> oh Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, what were you going to say about Elvis? I, I think I have an idea, but what were you going to say? I was going to say, it, it just reminded me of like Elvis, you know, getting up and taking uppers. So he's, you know, going and then having to take downers to go to sleep. You know, so yeah, this is like Elvis. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I think I think this is the more healthy uh, solution. <laughs> you, I think so too. Uh, some people even say like these Saurian records are like getting the benefits of ingesting mind-altering substances without actually, you know, having the physically uh, undesirable side effects. Yeah. Of actually ingesting pharmaceutical substances. That being said, I can also see, you know, we already talked about the pedal. I could definitely see a, a Saurian uh, cannabis strain uh, definitely in the works as well, I think. Dude, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember the Cheech and Chong movie where um, they put the Ajax on the paper plate and... Oh, no, I never saw that. sniffs it up, turns into a lizard, right? No, but... It's a great scene. Oh, man. Yeah. People are gonna do that after they listen to this album. No, <laughs> we, we... <laughs> yeah, don't, don't snort Ajax that, that was in a movie, but it will n not do anything good for you. I'm pretty sure. Oh uh, well, after, yeah. after, after don't do it. After after it's... the after the bleach drinking we had at the beginning of all this, I'm willing to believe anything now. So yeah, <laughs> don't don't drink bleach. Don't eat soap. Mm -hmm. Tide pods are not good. Um, stay in school <laughs> but uh and but dude, you can't even say that nowadays because going to school is not what it was when I was a kid now you know how what are your odds on like getting shot up at school if you're school age it's we live in crazy ass motherfucking times man do we, or are we, yes, do, or have the times always been crazy, and we just have more access of seeing it? That's the other question I go back and forth. Uh, you know, that's a reasonable question, but I think people have gotten fucking crazy. You I think can we do say that again. Crazy age. You could say that because, again. yeah. Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. On a more positive note, there was one fan question um, I did want to ask you, though, uh, because we've been seeing a lot of uh, death metal uh, anniversary tours lately, as we've seen with, you know, the Cavaliers doing Beneath the Remains and Arise. We, you know, it started with Fear Factory doing Demanufacture. Is there a chance, because In Their Darkened Shrines is my favorite Nile album, and actually, which is 20 years this year, actually, but it's also a 10 years... Wow. It's also 10 years of At the Gates of Sifu, so, um, or Sethu, and sorry if I did mispronounce that. Any chance we could get maybe like an anniversary tour if you would be uh, uh, willing to do so, and if you're allowed to say, of course. Uh, well, I think I'm, I'm allowed to say, you know, whatever. Um, no one's looking over my shoulder, <laughs> pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, except my Fender Strat. My Fender Strat is looking over my shoulder, right, so. Yeah. We can't say anything bad about Fender Strats. What, well, when it's in front of your shoulder, uh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, is there going to be an anniversary tour specifically for those records? It's probably highly unlikely, um, given today's touring climate, uh, that this band would be able to put together an anniversary tour 
that would live up to expectations um, and be economically viable. I don't um, know. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I say that phrase, it reminds me of Falling Down. Did you ever I was just Falling thinking Down? that. That's my favorite freaking movie of all time. I was just thinking that. <laughs> I love this movie. Oh, my God. And another movie that couldn't have aged any better. Oh, my God. You got to make an album. Please make a concept album on that movie. Please. I don't think there's a better <laughs> artist to do it. Please. You could write a song about every situation. Write a song about wanting breakfast during lunch hours. Write write a mm-hmm. write a song mm-hmm. about a and and I'm I, the scariest thing about this talk of conspiracy theories. I once had to spend a dollar fifty from a mm-hmm. Coca Cola from a vending machine, and I pulled up YouTube, and that scene of when he was complaining about eighty five cents for a soda was recommended to me on YouTube. So, dude, you know the the thing about Coca Colas uh, when I started touring, like. Uh, if if you pay like a buck seventy nine for a t- Coke now, right? That's what a Coke costs. In Mexico, it costs the equivalent of about twenty nine cents. In London, it costs the equivalent of like four bucks, right? Basically, the same bottle of Coca Cola. It might have been bottled in a different plant, but it's basically the same motherfucking thing. Or the price of cigarettes, right? If you buy smokes in Mexico City, or if you buy smokes in Paris, you'll pay radically different prices for the exact same motherfucking thing. It's a strange freaking world. Why does that tell us? What does that tell us? It tells us that I need to quit smoking. That's what it tells me. (laughs) Well, yes, that would be the first deduction, that, (laughs) you know, smoking is... But it also tells us that the price of stuff is based on what people will pay in that location, what they're used to paying, what they're willing to pay. Obviously, you can't sell a $4 bottle of Coca-Cola in Mexico. People are not gonna fucking buy it. Yeah. (laughs) They'll say, fuck you. Uh, But they will pay it in London because well, that's what a Coca-Cola costs in London. I would pay... How hard? I would pay money to see you do a podcast with the guys from Mastodon. I think the two uh, historical uh, music masters just having a conversation about reality. It would be cool to get a musical collaboration, but I'm cool with just paying money to hear a conversation between you and Troy Sanders. Well, they, they seem like really cool guys to me. Yeah. Um I've never met them, but of course, you know, we know them through their music and, you know, interviews and stuff they've done. They seem like pretty cool guys to me. Yeah, absolutely. So before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today and for another great conversation. It's always great to see you. (laughs) Is there just um, anything else uh, that you would like to promote for the release of the Story and Apocalypse album or anything with Nile or anything else you'd like to promote? Mm, well, we got a European tour coming up with Christian. It's one of my favorite bands on planet Earth. These guys are the real deal. Just spoke with I them love last Christian. week. Great guys. So, I just spoke with them last <laughs> yeah, they week. They got a new record. Yep. Yeah, I'm not supposed to be promoting Christian's new record, but hey, Christian's got a new record. <laughs> and I can tell you that it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I utterly believe you. Yeah. You like all the other ones that came before? have led me to a place where I will accept that as being very probable and probably true. Definitely. But thank you so much, Carl. Everybody, Carl Sanders, be sure to check out Saurian Apocalypse coming out very soon. And be sure to check out the latest Nile album, Bile Nalotic Rights. If you haven't checked that out, uh, that came out in 2019. It is an absolute masterpiece. We will see you next time on Heavy New York.